This My Thoughts Monday is brought to you by Kinetic Performance, the makers of the Rolls-Royce of barbell monitoring technology, the Gym Aware. Guys, in-season training, we rock the Gym Aware all the time for quite a few reasons. The first, of course, is just that, the ding. Every time the athlete hears that, they know that they're hitting exactly what we need from them at that moment. And when they don't hear it, it brings out that extra little bit of competitiveness within themselves. On top of that, that awesome ding ends out bringing together the athletes as well, pushing each other and getting each other to be able to hit numbers that they probably wouldn't hit at that portion of the year. And finally, of course, that ding helps us monitor, manipulate, and keep track of volumes and intensities so we can best dose our athletes during the season at the right time with the right amount. Guys, hop over to kinetic.com.au and check out what Evan and the team down there have because this is absolutely a sensational product that's changed the way that we've trained our athletes. This edition of My Thoughts Monday is brought to you by Valve Performance, the team behind the Nordboard, Force Dex, the Groin Bar, and Human Track. Guys, the most important ability for all of our athletes is availability, and that's the absolute goal of Valve Performance, is to provide solutions to performance professionals so that we can get the right information to make the right decision at the right time for the betterment of the athletes that we get to work with. To do this, guys, they have a wide range of validated products that focus on usability and having been founded by the School of Exercise and Nutrition Sciences at the Queensland University of Technology, they're extremely evidence-based and they're beyond transparent. I can tell you that our time using the Nord board and being involved with Force Dex, we have been introduced to so many amazing people that have truly helped us become better coaches, have a better understanding, not just of the technology, but also what we're doing with our athletes. So make sure you hop over to valveperformance.com today to make sure you check out what they got. It's going to make you better and to do better by your athletes. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is a combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hey, what's happening, everybody? Jay DeMeo coming at you with this week's edition of My Thoughts Monday. And today, guys, I would like to jump all in and get my hat in the ring here on this you know, conversation that's been going on now for the better part of a couple weeks. And it led to last week's podcast interview with Coach Mike Boyle, and I want to talk about this whole idea of sports-specific training. And, and more so, guys, I want to talk about the, the level of confusion and, and where I see some of it coming from when it comes to this idea of sports-specific training. Now, I, I think that it really boils down to, to the fact that there is some form of confusion when it comes to three different terms, and whether they are synonymous or not, or even opposites. And those three terms are sports-specific training, obviously, functional training, and what the theory of dynamic correspondence actually means. I'll get to sports-specific training last because that's where a lot of these issues and this confusion stems from. So I'd first like to start with, with functional training because 
having just having Mike on the show. I mean, obviously, I mean he's written the book on it three, four times over now, five times over, whatever it may be. Um, and and I think that that's where a lot of the confusion started. And I think that right now we've got a lot of coaches who take the term functional, and this is coaches in all spectrums, right? You're I'm sure you run into sport coaches who have this confusion when it comes to this term as well. And they think of functional training being more of a, a synonym to sport-specific training than, than it actually is. Now, when you look at functional training, in my opinion, functional training is going to be something that is more individual athlete and sport um, specific in a realm of the orthopedic manner. And what do I mean by that? You know, if you listen to that conversation with Coach Boyle, uh, it's the second time I've referenced it, so that should be a hint, 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 star, star, star. If you haven't listened to it, I would highly recommend it. It was, it was sensational. Um, you know, how he looks at his needs analysis is more of a, what are the common issues with athletes in that sport? Like, are they, do they have shoulder problems? Do they have groin problems? Do they have back problems? Do they have this, that, or the third, right? Um, and then designs programs around where these issues are in order to help decrease the likelihood of those issues showing up with that individual athlete or that team or group or whatever it may be. It makes complete sense, right? Because the greatest ability an athlete can have is availability, right? So if we're going to have these kids do all this work, let's make sure that we're sitting here and we're building off these things and we're making sure that they're going to be healthy, right? So if you've got a kid who has a history of ankle problems coming into you, you probably want to do more stuff to take care of their foot and ankle or look at what those problems are and help uh, I mean, correct them is, we all know, we can go on and on about if we either ever correct or not things, but looking at things in that manner, you know, are we going to be able to provide the athletes the ability to be more available for their sport? Okay. It's a different needs analysis than what someone who would follow the theory of dynamic correspondence would probably follow, right? Berkashansky's theory, dynamic correspondence, talks about, you know, basically the the movement of the right joints at the right time, with the right speed and the right contraction with the right muscles, you know, or parts of the movement. And this is where someone like a biomechanist, like Dr. Yeses, does a sensational job, right? Where he's broken things down and reevaluated how we all do lunges and reevaluated the the pawing action of running and, and how we can do that better. And they and some of these exercises do fall under that functional, if you may, umbrella when you're talking about like the paw back. After you go back and you review the interview we did with Dr. Heiderscheidt, uh, he talked about the hamstring pulls mostly occurring at right at that stance phase. Um, so we want to strengthen that action, right? Coming through and doing those things. The knee drive, Cal has talked about, and Doc is talking about ad nauseum that the ham, the, the excuse me, the hip flexors activity is when you're behind the body, right? When you're sprinting and running. So, looking at those things and those exercises, obviously, you know, thanks to Doc for building those things. But you're looking at more of a performance-based preparatory action versus a longevity and um, preventative needs analysis. I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm not saying you can't do both. I'm not saying that if you follow the theory of dynamic correspondence, you will or will not decrease the likelihood of injury to the athletes, you know, because people could argue that if you're training the same movements that they're doing in the sport, now you're increasing the risk of overuse injuries. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You could also say that if you're not strengthening the actions that they're actually going through and you're not moving them fast enough or you're not moving them quick enough or you're not moving at the proper um, contraction speeds or types and different muscles are moving in different ways that you're setting them up for injury too because the things that have to be the prime movers and the prime actors aren't doing the job they're supposed to. Okay, so that brings me next to sports-specific training. And I think that where that really gets demonized, it has been social media and where people see things like kids on attached to a Vertimax, dribbling a basketball, doing high knees in a speed ladder, and going crazy and talking about how that's sports-specific. 
Problem is we know it's not. Problem is we know that like doing a pull down with a basketball attachment is not basketball specific. You know, we know that things like that are just it, it just kind of a fake attempt to appease people. But you can do some exercises weighted. You can do some sporting exercises weighted. We know that too, right? Bunderchuk talked about that forever. Dr. B was doing light and heavy weights and light and heavy shot puts before 90% of the strength and conditioning coaches out there were even alive, winning gold medals doing it. So that does work. Dr. Yesis and Yosef have been talking about using slightly heavier shorts with sprints and in practice and things like that to help improve quickness and speed and change of direction. Hank talked about how super gravity training works, walking around with a weight vest at all times. So there are some of these things that, that, that could enhance performance. Now, I think with strength and conditioning coaches, probably what you're listening to right now and you're saying, well, yeah, but do I want to put these shorts on my guys at practice and then risk throwing things off and doing that and being a problem? Yeah, I, you know, it's a legitimate concern. And I, I don't think you're right, wrong, or indifferent on that. I, I, I have never done it, so I don't know. But I'm just saying that people have talked about it and it's not like some new thing. But really, at the end of the day, the, the big problem with all three is that we don't have a definition for them, right? You know, it comes down to how we use this needs analysis and whether it is um, more orthopedic or is it more preventative or is it more performance-based? And I think that in, in all, all of those individual situations, it can be definitely athlete-centric, definitely have autonomy with the athlete with it. But with that being said, we, we still need a definition. Like, is, is functional training going to be training the right joints to move the right muscles at the right time? Because if that's the case, that sure follows one of the principles of dynamic correspondence. And then, you know, when we look at what sport-specific training is, like, how are we going to define that? Like, what is it? What isn't it? And how does it fit? You know, because I do think at the end of the day, when Coach Boyle was talking about the 90%, I do think that most of us do pretty much follow that rule, especially initially, Right? I mean, if you don't know by now that Coach Boyle is going to do some sort of knee-dominant exercise, some sort of a hinge, some sort of a push, a pull, an Olympic-based movement, and then core work, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you other than get out from under the rock. But look at your programming. How much of it is that much different? We're going to do some form of a squat. We're going to do some form of a hinge. We're going to do some form of a lunging type or split squat type exercise. We're going to do some sort of unilateral exercise sideways more often than not. We're going to do a push and a pull vertical and horizontally, and we're going to do some stuff for shoulder dexterity and some midsection work. We're going to do that for just about everybody. Now, is every exercise going to be the same? Of course not. Is every team going to have the exact same progressions and regressions for what those setups are? Of course not. Are the set and rep schemes that Coach Boyle and I use the same? No, everybody knows they're not. Who cares? If you want to talk about how there's a million different ways to do things, don't sit here and get all butt hurt when somebody does something different. Because really, at the end of the day, without definitions, all we're going to do is continually hit roadblocks, especially with those three terms. Now, one of them is defined. The other two, I still think they're, they're up in the air. Like The one thing that coaches like to talk about the most and, and is like the best part of Nate Harvey's Instagram is when he goes off about it is core. I'm almost 40 years old. I've been a coach for the better part of 20 years. I can't tell you where the core starts and where the core ends. I think it changes every third day. Where is it? What is it? How is it? And don't sit here and tell me it's up to your own interpretation because there are things that aren't up to your own interpretation. This is a paper cup. Those of you listening and don't see, I am holding my Whole Foods coffee cup up right now. There is coffee inside of it. I don't care if you want to call it tea or not. It's not tea, it's coffee. Things need to be defined. That's how societies work. Language is important. And the language we need to figure out is what these things mean. So we can start talking about stuff and moving forward to things that actually matter. As always, guys, truly appreciate everything you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We'll be back next week with another My Thoughts Monday. I will see you then.